Good morning. Joining me for another interview from the Aurora Cultural Center is Robin Wardlaw of the NDP. My name is Bruce Cuthbert of Aurora Clicks. We are here today to explore the NDP's party platform for the upcoming election to be held on October 6th. Today, we are going to give Robin the opportunity to discuss the platform, and I'm going to ask him questions about it and explore that platform in detail. Robin, welcome aboard. Thank you very much. Good to be here. Thank you for coming. Yeah. We could start today by just giving us a uh, background, uh, politically and personally, of yourself. I'm a United Church minister. I have been for over 30 years. Most recently, I've spent uh, 15 years at the United Church in Newmarket on Main Street, uh, where it was a fascinating experience uh, dealing with a congregation that comes from all over the community, but uh, the walk-in business, if I could put it that way, was uh, people who live in the downtown and were um, really facing difficulties. We'll get into that more, I'm sure, as the, uh, as the time goes by, but it was a, an eye-opener for me about uh, what happened as a result of the uh, Mike Harris cuts back in 95, the tremendous um, effect on people who already had little and then had much of that taken away and were coping with very, very low incomes. So engaging the congregation um, with their neighbors who had so little uh, politicized me even more. Uh, the, the way I view um, the gospel is uh, as a, a call for justice, and uh, it was never more evident than being at the, in the office at that uh, church on Main Street in Newmarket, wh why we, we need to keep all parts of our society in communication with one another so that people see the, the gifts and the needs of uh, the other group, so to speak. Now, politically, um, ministers uh, try and remain a little bit neutral. So I have uh, refrained from showing my, my party colors uh, for a long time, but I'm on leave now between churches. I finished at the Trinity United in uh, June, so uh, the plan was to take a year off and uh, spend some time studying and traveling and um, enjoying my wife's first year of retirement. But instead, this opportunity came along, so it felt like a way to uh, continue doing in the political realm what I was already um, working at in the, uh, in the world of the church. Okay, good. What I'd like to do is, is just uh, go through your platform sure. um, and uh, just review it. Also, um, we have uh, had a number of debates. Um, you have answered many questions. I would like to kind of expand on some of those. Good. and. Uh, uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to have this uh, chance to do so. Excellent. Uh, first of all, one of the, uh, the big issues in the campaign is the HST. Your platform um, contains uh, taking the HST off daily essentials. Um, unlike uh, the other parties, you're, um, or, uh, you want to take HST not only off the energy bills, but you would also like to take it off uh, gasoline at the, at the pumps. Can you just explain, expand on your policy regarding the HST? The, the theme of the campaign is addressing some of the inequalities that are creeping into our society in Ontario. Bruce, just before I begin, let me say thank you to all the people I meet at the door who are acknowledging the death of Jack Layton. Um, I, mean, I will answer your question, but I, I, I wanted to be sure to get in my um, thanks to people who from all parties and from no party, who are um, who were touched by his life <coughs> and, and touched by his his death as well. It's been it's been touching, moving. Anyway, back to the, the question. Um, let's help make life more affordable. Is a major theme of the NDP platform this time, and something we will do in office is address the challenges that ordinary people are facing as their costs go up and up and their income stays the same, or in some cases even goes down. So take it off uh, home heating, take HST off home heating and hydro, that's a little monthly um, help to the budget, and it affects people at the lower end of the scale more because they spend more, a, per, a bigger percentage of their income on things like home heating and hydro, and begin to take it off gas at the, the pumps as well. Uh, that will save families um, you know, many dollars a month, hundreds, hundreds of dollars a year, uh, and that's getting a very good response at, at the door when I'm canvassing. Okay. 
Um, what else would you do in terms of the HST? One of the criticisms of both the Conservatives and yourself, uh, the NDP, is that uh, why just the yeah. uh, taking the HST off in selected areas? Right. If you're opposed right. to the HST, right. why not take it off everything? Sure, sure, sure. It's been woven now into the um, uh, government revenue, Ontario government revenues. It would be a very awkward. Uh, the BC case illustrates how expensive it will be to undo the decision to harmonize the two taxes. Uh, they'll spend something like three billion in a province with a smaller economy than Ontario to undo the HST out there. So that would be a wasteful way to go, but we can at least save people some of the uh, worst effects of it on things they can't avoid. You, you must pay uh, heat, heating and hydro so and gas uh, for your car. So take it off essentials, um, but acknowledge that it's now been um, thoroughly built into uh, Ontario government revenues. What if the, uh, um, and I read this in your platform, if the federal government uh, refused to go along with just taking it off part of the, uh, part, uh, just relieving part of the HST, sure, what, sure. what it, would happen then? It looks like an awkward situation, except we're only talking about the provincial portion of right. the HST, so that's within the provinces uh, say so. Okay. And we'll have to negotiate certainly with the, the federal government on that, but uh, we anticipate that uh, a federal government that uh, brags about cutting taxes will be all in favor of uh, helping us to do that. Okay. Okay. The next thing that uh, is, is a big component of, of your, your platform is, uh, and a little different from what the others are proposing in, in the sense that it's long-term planning, is the, your transit platform. Um, you're, you're proposing, uh, as everybody is, an increased uh, uh, transit schedule for, for GO Transit in terms of the uh, increased uh, GO Trains. Expand a little bit on what you're proposing differently yeah. than the other parties are. Yeah, good. Um, the, one of the ways that um, life has become more unequal in the province is through the downloading that the, uh, not the Liberals, but the previous Conservative government did, shifting costs from the province to municipalities, where it's very difficult on the property tax base for municipalities to uh, provide the services they were supposed to provide. So. The uploading is taking place now, uh, costs that belong to the province are going back to the province, and we, an NDP government will continue to do that, and also work on a 50-50 basis with municipalities to help fund those important transit uh, services, so that uh, fares can be frozen for four years. I mean, that's a right away begins to make life uh, more, more fair for people who depend on transit. But we also need to expand transit. I've talked about the spokes of the wheels, it's, it's pretty easy to get from Brampton or Newmarket or Peterborough down to Union Station. It's not as easy to get from Newmarket to Peterborough or to Guelph. And uh, we, we need to be working on a more comprehensive um, transportation system that works better for um, people's needs in the province. So we need a fund for that. Uh, we're looking at uh, improving mass transit all across the province, partly for affordability, so that people who don't have a car or uh, who don't who sh shouldn't need their car to get where they're going can get there, but also for the environmental effects because it's uh, just much better to have a bunch of people on a bus than everybody driving their own vehicle. I think that's pretty well accepted knowledge by now. And you, your belief is that we've got to redesign how we build our communities. Your, your belief is that Thanks, Bruce. communities yeah. are yeah. built yeah. Yeah. now yeah. with the fact that, uh, f fact in mind that uh, they're built around owning a car. Uh, thanks for the reminder. I have made that point on the uh, um, platform already in the in the campaign, and I appreciate that reminder. We we set it up so that we have you know a square mile of of um, what's that three square kilometers of uh, housing with no where to work in that whole area, and then over on the highway we've got a strip of um, factories and and other facilities where people are supposed to work but no houses nearby. There's, there's no way to walk to work or bike to work or to shop or for your leisure activities. We've planned our communities as if everyone had a vehicle or two and could get w where they wanted to go by car all the time on roads that we need to make wider and wider and wider all the time. So we're neglecting paths and, and uh, bike facilities and, uh, the, and transit. The, the way that uh, some Many or European cities seem to have grown organically, where work and, and life were, were closer together, and, and people aren't struggling then for facing car ownership and the commute to, to get where they're going. That will 
not be easy to undo. There's a lot of our, our infrastructure, our, the design of our communities that's built in. And how we, uh, how we overcome that, I'm not sure. But going forward, we can certainly do things differently. And maybe there are ways to look at um, the, the zoning bylaws across the province so that people can work and shop and play and live closer uh, to, to, to each other. Okay. Um, one, of the, one of the other uh, components of your program is making it easier for people to save for retirement. Mm -hmm. um, you're proposing something uh, quite different from what the others are, and yes. that's uh, a, an Ontario retirement plan. Yeah. Can you just uh, expand on that a little bit for us, please? Uh, people, some people are lucky and have an employer with uh, a pension plan and benefits. And the employer and the, and the employee are both putting away money year by year toward uh, a person's eventual retirement. But that's not true for everybody. In fact, only about a quarter of people have a defined benefit pension plan anymore in Ontario. The, the uh, pen, people's pensions have been taking a hit for a little while and the, the pressure, it sounds like to me, is increasing all the time to let um, the employer out of that responsibility totally. So, can we do something? Yes, we can. The NDP will set up a, a provincial pension plan. Um, I guess it won't be called the OPP. Those initials are already taken, <laughs> but, but uh, what, what do we call it? I don't know, but so, some provincial uh, pension plan so that if you're moving from employer to employer or you're on contract um, or you, your workplace closes down, you need to find another job, uh, you can be contributing consistently to a separate pension plan that will be preserving what you need for your, for your later years. Why not fr take that away from employers and make it something that individuals can simply, then we've got experts managing it, a, st a safe, dependable rate of return, and when you're ready for your, at your retirement, there it is waiting for you. The CPP is, was designed to, to do that, but we've let it stay small. People who are trying to get by on CPP and perhaps the old age security um, payment are living in poverty. It's mm -hmm. eleven, twelve thousand dollars a year for the one, and about six thousand for the others. That's their annual income, eighteen thousand dollars. That's not adequate today, okay. and that's again back to the inequality that I was talking about. Some people are doing very well, as you know. They have huge severance packages and um, gigantic uh, pay and, and benefits. They, they won't be suffering in their retirement. But we're thinking about the other people who who seem to be falling behind. Okay. Um, uh, let's move on to the uh, electricity and, and, and those prices. Um, uh, you've already said that uh, you would uh, remove the HST on those bills. Um, what else would you do to bring electricity prices under control? Uh, that is a major component of, of your platform and, and I'd like you to just you address that, please. Sure. The, the, um, a, a previous government broke up Ontario Hydro uh, ready to sell off portions of it to private industry. They needed to dismantle it and take the debt away and um, so that industry wouldn't, private industry wouldn't have to, uh, to, to bear the actual cost of building up all that expensive infrastructure. So an NDP government will put hydro back together and make it more efficient that way. We'll cap CEO salaries in the, in the public sector so people aren't making uh, uh, many, many times what their employees are making. Uh, that, that will begin to help. We'll continue to make Ontario Power more green. At first, that's expensive because the technology is still in development. But as the price, like with computers and cell phones and everything, we watch the price fall down, down, down. The price of solar and, and wind technology is going to be dropping as we continue to innovate in those areas. The price of uh, coal and, and uh, gas is not actually borne by the customer because a lot of it is a cost to the environment. All those things go up the smokestack. No one pays for those emissions except we all uh, struggle with our breathing and the pollution and the uh, climate change that's all around us and affecting uh, the whole planet. So the hidden costs of, of fossil fuel are huge but don't turn up on the bill. The hidden costs of nuclear are in the uh, refurbishing of those facilities. So it, it is touted as safe, dependable, cheap, but in actual fact, every nuclear facility has run way over cost to build. And then when we come to the re repair time after 25 years, 40 years, the repair bills are astronomical. So let's um, keep the nuclear we have, finish the uh, ongoing uh, repairs that are underway now, but not continue to 
redevelop nuclear, let's gradually shut that down. It's just too expensive in the long run for all of us. Never mind the ongoing um, cost and danger of getting of dealing with all that nuclear waste. So go to um, alternative energies more and more, and watch the price of those drop. And finally, um, conserve. The cheapest kilowatt hour is the one we don't use. So work with people who already are using, um, let's say, gas in some industrial uh, process or to heat something and turn that into a cogeneration facility. Give a homeowner $5,000 for a home energy retrofit so they can get the much more efficient furnace or put insulation in the attic or whatever it is that will uh, lower their costs on the one hand and reduce the burden on the climate, on, on the environment on the other. So it's a whole uh, array of things that we're going to do to address individuals' costs, they'll, have, they'll use less energy, and then the costs of the system as well. We need to be smart so are that. you suggesting that you're in agreement with the, the current subsidized uh, 80 cents and 40 cents yep. for the... the, yep. the yep. Yep. How, um, the, first of all, um, do you not think that puts us at a competitive disadvantage? Although there, I agree there is long-term benefit and we do have to head towards um, green energy at some point. Um, do you not feel yeah, there has yeah, to be a mix yeah, in that yeah. right now that subsidization is, is, puts us at a competitive advantage? It seems silly to pay 80 cents for a kilowatt hour when you can only sell it for five, but in fact on the spot market the price of power is sometimes 90 cents. So if, if the economy were humming along, if we had full demand on our system, we would see much higher um, resale prices for electricity. But my main point is that it's 80 cents now for those green kilowatt hours, but that price will be dropping. It's not going to be 80 cents forever. As the cost to produce um, clean energy drops, so will the, the uh, cost of buying it. So it'll be 70 cents, 60 cents, 50 cents. It'll be coming down closer to uh, the other costs that we're used to. And remembering that we're not actually paying the full cost of those other sources of energy. We've been kidding ourselves that we could get coal and, and, and gas generated electricity for four cents a kilowatt hour. That's, that's the obvious cost of the fuel. That's not the cost to our planet of, of producing that energy. So we're trying to compare apples and apples. Okay. Yeah. What, uh, one of the questions I asked at the Aurora debate and uh, <clears throat> you answered yes to was the fact that um, uh, I mentioned the fact that the, the, uh, the wind farms were causing medical complications with several people. In fact, companies had yeah, been yeah, sued. Yeah. Um, you had mentioned that further medical research was, was required before further implementation. Um, how serious a factor do you consider that to be in the, the further implementation of these wind, wind farms? Yeah, uh, thanks for allowing me to expand on that because those uh, little snapper questions, yes, no, it didn't allow any room for, for uh, discussion of, of That's the, one of the, the reasons the I held this forum was yeah, for, so yeah, people could yeah. clarify Exactly, I appreciate, I appreciate yes. that very much. Um, Yes, my, my longer answer would have been yes, the NDP government will always look at the, the latest and the best and, and more evidence on any health-related issue, whether it's wireless devices in classrooms or turbines in the field a kilometer from your house. What, what is the actual, do we know the actual effect yet? Have we got the, the science that will allow us to test? Are, are people getting sick because of those um, turbines or because they've been told they'll get sick from those turbines. It's a, that's a very, um, a very tricky issue that we're just venturing into and we, we don't want to assume the one or the other. An NDP government will look very carefully at the best evidence and keep looking for more evidence about, about those things. What we do not want to do is set up what we imagine are you know, a wonderful way to produce energy but have all the neighbors around that wind farm with headaches and nausea and the, the symptoms that some people there are reported. That's, that's not fair to them. So uh, what that evidence is, I don't know. I'm not a scientific expert on, on uh, subharmonic uh, effects of wind turbines, but let's get people in who can do that and, and study it and, and make our decisions based on the good evidence. One of the things I personally would suggest to anybody conducting one of these, uh, um, uh, this type of research is to do the research on some of these victims. Uh, to my knowledge, none of the research has been done on anyone who has complained or, or anything like that. Well, so um, that would be interesting to find out. 
You're further ahead than I am. That's not been a subject that I've, I've researched carefully, but I don't know if they've been yes. studied or not, but let, why not do that? Yes. I mean, it just makes perfect sense to me. Okay. Um, you mentioned putting a cap on, um, and this kind of leads into another subject, on CEO salaries. Um, one of the bugaboos uh, with many people is union salaries. And being with the NDP, I know that uh, there's a fondness for unions, uh, to say the least. Um, how do you feel about um, union salaries? And we just had uh, an interview with Frank Cleese, and part of their platform is to limit union donations uh, to political causes. So uh, maybe you could touch on your views on, um, on both those things. Yep. Keeping, uh, in light of the fact that you want to put caps on CEO salaries, um, which is you know, part of your prerogative of your platform, how do you feel about putting, keeping uh, uh, public sector salaries more in line with private sector and uh, um, putting some kind of limitation on mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. directing union dues towards political parties? Yeah, yeah. there are a couple of excellent questions there. Uh, let's start with election financing. There have been reforms in the, for the federal parties. Uh, I think we're due for reform for Ontario parties. I'm not sure that the way we're funding our, our parties and our elections is the fair way to go because the cap on donations is almost $10,000. Well, I can't contribute $10,000 and I don't know many people who can, but, but uh, some people can do that and they donate to certain parties and not to others. Uh, that makes a very unlevel playing field. Let's address that, have a lower limit on donations so that uh, it's harder for any one person or corporation or union to influence a political party. Let's make it uh, many, many small donors instead of um, donors, a few donors with deep pockets who, who can uh, have an influence on a, on a political party by their support. Um, so the, that leads into the, the other question you asked about um, salaries and stuff. I think it's ironic that uh, people who complain about high union salaries are themselves uh, uh, getting double-digit increases often. The, the, the well, so, so not necessarily because there are people uh, for example, they, they may be cleaners in the, in the private sector who are complaining about union... Some of the, some of the loudest complaints are coming from CEOs and, and very, very Granted. wealthy people yes. whose salaries are now in the many millions and, and growing rapidly. The, the, the um, disparity between those at the top and, and the rest of us is big and growing faster and faster. That's a huge concern. That's the heart of that the That takes care of the CEOs. Campaign. I'm just talking yeah. about the yeah. cleaner and the I'm private sector. Yes, I'm getting there. Okay. So the, the uh, unions have over a century or more in Canada had, have helped ordinary working people to get wages that will actually support their life. You can afford a home, you can raise your family in safety, you can plan for their future, you can provide for their tuition, you have a little cushion in case something happens. Uh, once we begin to take apart the laws that uh, protect the right to unionize, and the Conservatives were, uh, did that fairly freely, uh, we start to see average incomes drop and drop and drop. So rather than see public sector wages fall to those of the private, the NDP would rather see private sector wages rise to those of the, of the public sector. Because it's not as if the um, public sector employees are uh, all getting rich. They're, they're making do. They have enough to be secure. And that's what I think most Ontarians want. They're working for $12, $14 an hour. They, they may resent the, the person with much more, the NDP would say, it's wrong that you're working at 12 and $14. It's, it's just unfair. Let's have a province where the, you, the average person is getting much, much more than that and some security from pension and benefits, like I mentioned before. The, the, the creeping inequality in this society is slowly killing us. Fair enough, and that's consistent with your policy yeah. also yeah. to increase the minimum wage to $11, yeah. Yeah. which would therefore push up other wages in the mm -hmm. private sector to above $11 uh, uh, proportionally. And peg it to inflation. Right. Because what tends to happen is that it, it was, uh, an, uh, an increase is announced with a big uh, fanfare and then it just stays there for It for stabilizes some, and doesn't move. It never moves. Okay. So for eight years under the So that would solve the problem if the minimum wage would not solve the problem but would help rectify the, a dire situation. If the minimum wage was raised to $11 proportionally, other wages would rise uh, correspondingly. And, and the, if pegged to the rate of inflation, your thinking is, is that it would continue to, to rise and you wouldn't be left behind at the $11 forever. At the heart of this discussion, Bruce, is how do we distribute 
the wealth that Ontario generates. Is there a more fair way to do it? I, I believe yes. The NDP believes yes, there's a more fair way to do it. Having the people doing the work in the mines, in the forests, in the factories, in the stores, in the hospitals, in the schools, uh, getting a, a, a unsustainable income while other people get fabulously rich is not the way forward for Ontario. And the, the people I meet when I knock on doors agree with me. They, I don't have to tell them that problem. They all know it. And, and there seems uh, to be a hunger for a, a society that's much more fair, and that's where we're coming from. Okay, that, uh, that brings me to the next component in your platform, and that's the, uh, we've kind of touched on the, the uh, protecting jobs, um, but we're also, uh, comes to the fact that uh, the corporate uh, tax rates, um, yeah. you feel, uh, yeah. your party feels, yeah. that yeah. those corporate yeah. tax rates are already competitive yes. enough, especially in comparison, comparison to competitive jurisdictions that uh, um, yeah. uh, we compete with. Yeah. Um, do you want to just elaborate that, on that a little bit? Thanks, Bruce. Yeah, I do, because the, the uh, other debates who had one and two minute answers, there's not much you can say in that right. time. So this is wonderful. And this is the very reason that I exactly, decided yeah, to do this. Exactly, yeah. I'm so glad. Uh, in, in Ireland, the corporate tax rate is zero. And they have huge unemployment. Having a zero tax rate doesn't necessarily guarantee you corporations coming in to set up and stay. If other conditions are right, they will come. It's, it's not all about having the, the cheapest taxes. We already have the cheapest taxes, as you mentioned. We're at around 29% combined federal and provincial. Other jurisdictions around us tend to be in the upper 30s, 7, 8, 9% more uh, tax than, than we get. Uh, so it's not as if we have to keep racing to the bottom and, and it's time to acknowledge that's not the only thing that corporations look at. The theory was that if we reduced corporate tax, that extra money that they saved would go into job creation, research and development, capital investments, expanding the business. Well, uh, that was a good theory. We've been trying that now for 16 years in, in Ontario and in some jurisdictions uh, longer than that. So the evidence is coming in. What, what happens when you lower taxes? Uh, Statistics Canada did a report two years ago that shows that uh, over roughly uh, 20 years, as corporate taxes have been going down, their bank accounts have been going up. Employment, investment in research and development, investment in capital has stayed the same, basically. Little fluctuations, but it has not gone up to match the, 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 um, uh, deduct the, the, the reductions me, that they were getting in their taxes, the way that the theory predicted. So. I think it was Einstein said, if um, you keep doing the same thing and expect a different result, that's called madness. Why would we keep doing what we've been doing if it isn't working? Stop doing that, put the corporate tax rates back up one year to 2010 levels, that will be a huge income gain for the province, that will help the NDP fund many of its uh, good promises. And also send a signal that we're, we're in favor of fairness in the tax system, we're not going to keep rewarding companies that aren't creating jobs and in fact are shipping jobs overseas while putting the tax burden onto hardworking members of our society. Let's have a fair sharing of that tax burden. Okay. Yeah. Um, just uh, on a side point, um, Ireland does have zero uh, percent <coughs> tax rate and they do have high unemployment. Um, there may be other reasons for it. A, a lot of North American companies put their head offices there. In other words, they keep their books there mm. to get a zero, mm. zero tax yeah. rate. Um, one of the other things that uh, is part of your program is to buy Ontario to build Ontario's economy. Yeah. Um, do you want to elaborate a little bit on that? Sure. Uh, we we uh, spend a lot in, in government on cement and uh, railroad uh, uh, facilities and, and on and on and on. Uh, why not, if possible, spend the bulk of that buying from Ontario producers, especially if the uh, cost difference is slight. There was a 2% difference between an Ontario firm and a, a Quebec firm for some, um, I think it might have been go train cars or maybe subway, go train cars, I think it was. And uh, because the, there was a 2% better price in Quebec, we, we went to Quebec to buy them. Well. That means workers in Thunder Bay are, are out, of, out of work. They, they should have been making those cars. This is something that under the, uh, the general agreement for 
tariffs and trades, a, a world um, regulation with this kind of thing, is allowed. Uh, levels of government under the national government are permitted to shop around within their jurisdiction. So towns and cities and provinces can buy locally. It's something that's permitted under international rules. And that will help keep, uh, keep jobs here. We're not against uh, Quebec firms. We're not against American firms. And there will certainly continue to be some purchase there. But when the difference is very slight, in other words, it's almost a tie, let the tie go to the Ontario runner. So to say. What would happen, though, if we received reciprocal treatment? Um, wouldn't that become sort of a, an internecine practice, in other words, self-destructive, where uh, we would now limit our market to ourselves, and you, each you, other province you, would do the same sure, thing? Sure. There is a risk from uh, starting up uh, trade issues like that. As you say, the Americans are already starting on that with this uh, Buy America right. drumbeat that's rolling over the border. And I think this time no amount of discussion from the Canadian government will change their minds. They, they're in quite a, a pickle down there. Uh, but as somebody pointed out, our economies are so interwoven that a product can go back and forth across the border seven times before it's actually finished and ready for the, the final consumer, whether it's steel or, or some other kind of uh, material in it. So there's no way to avoid that. How can, how can you tell what, uh, a vehicle is made in Canada when parts of it have been made all over the world? It's uh, been shipped, by, the raw materials have been shipped across many borders and so on. It's pretty complicated these days. But uh, the, the example I gave is a good one because the, although the parts for a Bombardier um, go train car might come from all over the place. The, the final assembly jobs are in a, an Ontario plant and let's uh, keep those people working. Your point was about trade wars. We don't want to start a trade war. We're doing what's permitted within international rules. The, um, it's the FIT, the, the FIT, the feed-in tariff program, that's actually being challenged now by Japan. So the Liberals have a bit of a problem. They uh, decided they would have this um, uh, 50, 60 percent made in Ontario uh, standard for green energy and Japan is challenging that and they're allowed to do that under the international rules. So the NDP is uh, uh, on the side of the Saints and the, the, the Liberal government has created a bit of a challenge for right. Ontario. Yes. So um, one, of the first, one of the questions that never came up in the Frank Cleese interview <clears throat> was the uh, Everyone knows that the, the Conservatives don't support that deal. Do you support the Samsung deal? Yes, yeah, the, the, uh, the deal needs to go ahead. We, we'll, it will create jobs. But do you support the way it was negotiated with no bid for no. any other international company no, or no. any we, Ontario company? I, I, to be honest, I don't fully understand the, the behind-the-scenes machinations and why the government thought a sole source contract was the way to go. Uh, I'm not completely uh, up-to-date on that. I can't imagine that a, uh, an NDP government would have done it in that way. Uh, what, what they thought the advantage was, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe Samsung was the only company that was willing to do it. I just don't know that. But we would certainly be more open and transparent in everything we did, including that kind of giant, uh, giant deal for the province. Um, now, uh, let's move on to um, the education. Um, just before we do, I should say one okay. more thing. Um, I challenged uh, the Conservative uh, candidate on that deal. He's prepared, he and his party are prepared to rip it up. Yes. And I'm saying how to create giant uncertainty about Ontario as a place <coughs> to invest if you tear up a contract like that that's you know, well into uh, its um, execution. Come along and, and, and abrogate it. What message does that send out to the, the world of commerce about Ontario? Anyway, so, on, sorry, on to your next question. Well, I yeah. guess, <clears throat> excuse me, I guess um, I watched that, uh, that debate and uh, their response was uh, they feel that would encourage actually uh, more, more people to come yeah. forward. Yeah. I can't speak for the candidate, but yeah. I, I did watch your exchange yeah. on, on, on the debate. Yeah. Um, uh, when it comes to the education, uh, the Conservatives have flat out said no, they're not going to reduce um, um, tuition fees or put a cap on them. Um, the Liberals are proposing a 30% reduction. Yes. Um, what is the NDP's policy? The NDP uh, is aware that Ontario's undergraduate tuition rates are the highest in the country. Our, our, post, our, our graduate um, tuition costs are the second highest in the country. Something's gone off the rails. We had a a world-class post-secondary education system in the province that, when I went, was quite affordable. 
I could work for the summer and pay for tuition and residence in four months of summer work. Well, that is no longer possible. Students are graduating with $26,000 OSAP debt on average. It's just not sustainable. Uh, they start off into an uncertain work world with this big uh, millstone around their neck. We're going to freeze tuition rates so they, they won't go up for the four-year term of our government. The Liberal plan is to reduce them by 30% with this credit, but they haven't said anything about the rates. So the rates will creep up if they go up by 5% per year, as they have been, by the, the end of the four-year mandate, the students are no farther ahead. They've crept right back up to um, where they were before this um, um, uh, rebate. So we, we think our plan is, is the good one. We're aware that uh, universities have a $2 billion um, infrastructure hole. They've, they've been, to keep other costs lower, to keep the doors open, they've been putting off necessary renovations for their buildings, their labs, uh, all their facilities. And we will help universities to do that so that they can remain open and safe and, and, and progress as uh, places of higher education. We'll take the provincial portion of the debt off OSAP loans going forward, if not, unfortunately not for those that are already incurred, but for new OSAP loans, we'll let them be interest free. That will help students upon graduation a little bit. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not huge, but it's a, a little signal that we're on their side and, uh, and aware of the, the huge burden that they may incur. Okay, okay when it comes to, to um, health care, um, um, I'll let you expand yourself. You, uh, you also support scrapping the, the lint. Yeah. Um, you all support, also support um, uh, changing the way we deal with long-term health care. Um, um, you also support decreasing uh, wait times. Uh, yeah. I'll let you go ahead and expand yeah, on yeah, those issues yeah. um, since you know them much better than I do. Wait times at the emergency have stayed high. We want to cut those in half and we have a, a, a plan for doing that. Uh, wait times to get into long-term care if you have complex medical needs are um, inexcusable. There are 25,000 uh, uh, people in Ontario waiting to get into a long-term care facility. There are only 77,000 beds. So that's a third again of the list of people waiting to get in. Many of those have complex medical needs and we'll get rid of that wait list by uh, uh, building new facilities so that there's, there's space for people. But back up a couple of steps. Before you get to long-term care, people are in their own homes where they would like to be, prefer to be, where they're healthier actually because their surroundings are familiar and, and so on. They're not, um, they're not taken away from the, the home where they've been for, uh, for some time. So how can we keep people in in their home? Well, increase home care, add a million hours of um, service for people, of care for people in their home, add seven and a half million hours of care around their home. You need the leaves rake, the snow shovel, the eaves troughs cleaned out because you can't do that anymore yourself, but those simple things would allow you to stay put. will uh, in increase the um, service that we're providing to our, our um, frail and elderly neighbors and, uh, and family members. Before that, in terms of um, your health declining, back up even further, and we get to the NDP ideas about health pre um, sickness prevention and health promotion. So now we're looking at, and that kind of ties into what I was saying about communities and, and making them more livable, but looking at our society as a whole, what is it that we're doing on TV, advertising junk food to kids and, um, uh, letting the uh, stuff go ahead in, in school cafeterias and um, coin boxes and so on uh, that cost us as a society huge issues. 90% uh, of type 2 diabetes can be prevented. 90%. 80% of um, heart uh, health issues can be prevented with lifestyle and, and exercise and so on. Uh, something like a third of cancers are preventable. Smoking and other uh, kinds of issues uh, uh, affect whether or not we get, we get cancer. So make it the easy to do, the desirable thing to do for ch children to have more phys ed in schools and um, more um, playgrounds and more paths for riding and walking for, for all of us throughout our lives to stay fit and healthy rather than 
um, becoming a burden to our, our neighbours because our, our health declines. We don't make it very easy at the moment. The commute is too long, people sit in their car, eat in their car, um, and, and instead of getting the, the exercise that they need and want. So the, it's a comprehensive approach to health that starts with promotion and ends with improving access to primary care, for example. 900,000 uh, people in the province don't have access to primary care, a doctor or some kind of clinic. The, the uh, Liberal government said that they would help with that. They've got about a third of the way toward their goal. It's, I mean, they're moving in the right direction, but it's just a very slow uh, progress. We'll, we'll be many, many uh, decades waiting at that rate for Ontarians to get the access to primary care. You've got something uh, small, you've got a, a, some kind of issue, a mole turns up and you're not sure, should I be getting this checked uh, for, is it more serious? You need to get to a, a primary care provider sooner, while that still can be, uh, I think the phrase is nipped in the bud, but you know, right. it can be stopped while it's uh, maybe a minor matter. Or you can decide it is only a minor matter, it's just, just a mole, it's not going to turn into anything. And uh, our, our plan will um, grow the number of uh, doctors to some extent, especially in underserviced areas, and it will set up um, clinics, 50 clinics across the province, take, with a combination of midwives, nurse practitioners, doctors, and other uh, medical staff, so that people really can get their their needs met quickly uh, before anything becomes a big big issue. Okay. Before I let you go, I have one more question, um, and, and it uh, relates to the final um, uh, component of your platform, and that is um, in terms of getting to where we need to go, um, as the way you put it, um, living within our means. Yeah. Yeah. We. Um, We've been borrowing a lot, but <clears throat> sometimes you need to do that. I mean, there was a, a recession, so everybody agreed that we needed to uh, stimulate the economy. I think all parties finally came around to that. But in the meantime, we've been uh, giving away the store, uh, back to corporate tax cuts. Since 95, when we started cutting uh, taxes for the very large corporations and the very wealthy, the very wealthy, I mean, we're talking about high six-figure, seven-figure and, and higher incomes in the province, the, the, um, the foregone taxes, if I can put it that way, have gone up and up and up. If we hadn't changed those rates for 16 years in a row, there would be $18 billion more per year coming into the provincial coffers. $18 billion. While the deficit this year, even after the infrastructure spending, is only $15 billion. We'd be in much better shape. So we're doing things that are simply unaffordable as a province. We're, we're rewarding people who are supposed to be creating jobs and instead are, are not doing that and shifting the burden on to you and me and, and everyday Ontarians. We, we just need to do something different. So it turns out that the best money managers in Canada are NDP governments. I got a, a kind of a derisory reaction when I said that uh, the other day at a, at a debate. Uh, people simply didn't believe it, but uh, Statistics Canada did crunch the math and looked at the 52 years that NDP governments have been in government, uh, NDP uh, party has been in government across different provinces in, in Canada. And who had the smallest deficits and the fewest deficits? NDP governments. And the Conservatives were behind and the Liberal governments were way behind. So it, it's not something we made up, it's not spin, it's the, the facts from Statistics Canada. The best, most sensible money managers are are the NDP. They're, they're, it's a party started by working people. They, they get what it's like to try and balance the budget and that's what we do when we're in office too. Okay, well thank you very much for coming in today Robin. It was a good opportunity to, to it was speak a good with you and, and a good opportunity to get your message out yeah. to clarify some points and uh, I thank you once again for coming in. So let me just say right to the viewer on October 6th, vote for change that puts people first. Thanks. <laughs>